how's it going and welcome back to Mario. In this episode, we're going to be looking at a way of identifying open computers components without needing to know their ID. So, if that sounds like something you're interested in, take a look around. And if you like what you see, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. But, let's get started. So in the last episode, we set up this sheep farm with the wool on it and what I'm now calling Potter Farm because we're going to have other farms in here as well but at the moment we've just got the wool farm and it's doing pretty well now of course this guy's going to drop some wool off into here potentially which is going to go down into this mechanism pipe and down underground here we've got a rogue sheep and that course goes all the way over to here to our station We've got another road sheep there. We've got a couple of road sheep around now. Uh, but this guy goes into here, of course, and collects up. See, we've got quite a bit of stuff in here. And the train comes around, picks the stuff up, and takes off to the village over there somewhere. Now, in a previous episode, we set up this rail map here, which shows us all of the Waterview line, along with where the trains currently are. And yeah, there's only the one train that I took to get here, currently sitting at Waterview. The rest of them are all offline and we'll get to the reason why in a future episode. But you can also see that I haven't really added anything in since that episode. Because if you remember it's quite complicated to get it to work because we've got to put down one of these microcontrollers. Once the microcontroller is down we grab this tablet here. We run a specific program where the microcontroller sends its hey I'm this ID. We then go to that controller we use the tablet on it, and that sends a signal back to the main machine to set it up. Which is quite a lengthy process. Now something I found out is, if we open this tablet here. Uh, do we have the events program on here? No, I don't. Let me just pull that in. Events Lua. Very simple program. Basically just continuously waits for an event, and debugs what it's seeing. Uh, we'll run that. Yep. Events. Oops. Events. So of course just exiting it out will receive the key up events, the key down. Uh, we can uh, mouse click. And you can see it's just outputting everything that happened on an event. Whether it's a modem message or whatever. And I've been using this quite a bit just to identify what the signals are we're getting. But if you remember when we were using it in the past, if we were to hold down shift, right click on here for at least a second or two and let go that would generate a tablet use event which gives argument 2 containing a pos x a pos z and a pos y and of course that's the information we would send back once we found the tablet but if we throw this into here and of course we're in creative so it's really quick and we don't lose anything but if we go into here and go open computers if we hover over the analyzer here, you can see that you can actually stick it in. And I was looking at one of the change logs recently, and it said you can put an analyzer in there. It doesn't really explain what happens though. But I found out that normally, of course, if you shift and right click on a device, you get to see the address and the type and the other information, such as in this case, it's 16BB18B8. If we stick the analyzer into here, we'll remake the tablet. We'll open this up again. We have components, the starters, oops, components. You can now see that there is a barcode ready here. And you will be asking yourself, what's barcode reader do? Go into here, component.barcode reader. It actually does nothing. There's no nothing. There's nothing there that actually happens or does anything, but it does generate an event. If we go in and we go events, like we were before, once again, you can see all the drops and stuff. We go into here, we do our shift and our right click for at least a second, because if you don't do a second, it pops up the interface to stick a disk in. Bring it into here, we're now going to tablet use event. Argument 2 is a table consisting of pos y, pos z, and pos x. But you can now see we've got a new thing called analyzed, which is another table. 
with item 1 being another table, type computer, and address 16BB18B8. And if you remember, which I'm sure you can, but we'll just double click that again, go over to here, 16BB18B8, the same address is reported here as is in there. So that would mean that we can do some cool things to avoid having to find the device every time and to find its position because we'll be able to just right click it and say this is a new device, put it in the system. Plus, it also works on other things such as screens. If we go into here, we shift and we hold down right click for a, lot, a few moments, go into here, type screen, it's got an address of 67C6D1DF blah 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 which is effectively the ID of or the identifier for this device. We can do the same with this guy, although it reports as computer, I'm not sure how that's going to work later on for what I'm thinking. We can grab Redstone IO, place that down, you can see that in Waylo it's showing 7 7ABF we go into here, we hold down shift, we right click, let go, 7A, B, F, redstone. So, what that might let us do, is set up a system similar to what's used on the internet to translate, when you type in something like google.co.nz, or .com, or .co.uk, or wherever you are, it translates that into a number that the system recognises such as 192.168.1.1. Of course, we can't remember these numbers, but we, we do remember things like Google. And because we can now get the IDs for these, we could give everything a name. We could give that redstone component that we placed down and has since broken, we could give it a name. And on top of that, if we were to say, oh, actually, I don't want that one there. I'm going to put it here. If it's got a different ID, like that one there's got a different ID, so that's C2, and that one there's 86. If we wanted to change where they are, because we got them wrong, you've got to enter that whole name in there again. So what I'm thinking I'm going to do is write up some code, which works very similar to the domain name system, and I'll be back in a moment. Okay, so I think I've got something that's going to work here properly. For starters, we're going to need a machine that is going to be the server for the component name system. Now, currently all I've got is actually just this one machine is able to request stuff from itself. We'll look at using a more complex system in a future episode. But we're going to start this up for a CNS server for component name system server. And it just returns back to the normal because it's going to run in the background. And that allows us to run our normal process, like if we were running the rail map over here, we could run this and run this first, then run the rail map. And then, once the rail map's running, it can use the server's information to collect up its stuff. On the tablet, um, I have changed the tablet around. In fact, let me just stick it in here so you can see what we've done. You can see I've taken the linked cart out. Uh, I'll put the tablet into the air so you can see what's going on. So I put a wireless network card tier 2 in here. I did try with a tier 1. It just wouldn't recognize the machine in there. Obviously we've got an analyzer, which is a new thing in here. Everything else, however, is the same. And I've also got a tier 2 network card, wireless card in here as well. Uh, I have taken the linked card out because the linked card is currently assigned to this guy. And I'm going to have to change the code for this so that it can take the signals, but it can do it over the wireless. Of course, wireless does have a limitation on how far it can go, so we're going to have to play around with that. But if we go into the tablet, turn that on, on this side, we have a CNS name. This, of course, is the GUI for naming the machines. The first thing we're going to do is select our server because this might be one machine that's working, and of course this might be another one. So we're going to select this one here. And you can see that it's requested from here, because I've got some debugging in there, it's requesting, hey, does this machine exist? So there's an ARP request. I'm not going to go into ARPs. 
and then we do a, a name server lookup for this machine. If it returns, then it goes, yes, cool, we're ready to go. If it doesn't return, this will from a, a complaint about it. So like if we do it here, Uh, let's change it. You can see it's not going to find the address because this guy is not running a name server. No, never can't respond. But if we go over to here, we can put this guy back. Change to it. Finds it. And now, you can see that if we wanted to, we could actually go over here and name this, or we could, let's just do some of the common stuff we use, of course, are the Redstone I.O. and a transposer. At the moment, what we have to do is we have to find the address, which is the 559B211, and put that directly into the code. Which is quite tedious, and as I said, if we break it and put down a new one, but for whatever reason, we lose the, the ID and we have to put a new one in. But now we can shift... Hold down the right click for more than a second, which will generate a tablet use. You can hear when you let go that it beeps. And it says, this is a redstone at that location. It's got that address, which is right, 559. Yes, it is. Cool. We can give it a name. So we can call this Bob. Component name saved. And you can see, or hear, that something happened behind here. So we got from here, we got an update for Bob with the ID, and just have a little description. So let's then save that back to the disk here. So if we then request this guy, which is a transposer, same thing will happen. We can name it. Let's just call it the default name for now. Once again, saves it. We can see it over here, coming in, transposer. Now if we go into this guy and we click it, it tells us it's Bob, because we've already named that guy. We could change the name, obviously. It'll update. We'll see an update request coming for Bob too. Oh, and of course, because one of the things we're using a lot of is we are using computers all over the place, or microcontrollers, we well, might want to talk to those. Now, of course, a computer may be a server, like this guy, or it might be a, a machine we want to talk to. Do the same thing here. It makes a different beep. But this time it's saying, do you want to set entries on the server or name it? So before when we were testing it, we done change, and then it'll go off and test to make sure it's a valid server. Or we can give it a name. Computer, blah, blah, blah. We're going to call this Rail Map. Like that. That saves it over there. So now this machine will recognize it as Rail Map. So the naming system works pretty well. But of course, the power is not in the naming system. The power, if we just clear this out, if we look in here, this stores all the information it needs in these files here. As you can see, here's our IDs for the name server, the transposer, the Bob, Bob2, RailMap are all stored in here. And you can see that we actually allow for two Bobs. Because you might have an old Bob and a new Bob. So they've still got the same ID. Only one of these will, ref if you use this one here though, it'll reference one of them. If we go into here, I do have a function which will do the lookups. And we'll be able to use that for computers, but I've also mapped it up so we can use components. So if we go into component.get Bob, we get no such component. Oh, which one was our Bob? Bob is our redstone. Uh, and of course, I have not connected those up. It would probably help if we connect them up to something. So there should be... Let's grab that temporarily. Like a very nasty connection along there. Now, of course, this guy will have access to it. So let's just double check components. Oops. Components. Uh, there's a redstone there. Now there's, okay, that might work better. So if we go component dot get bob, it returns that ID, which of course matches what's up there. Or we could do something like component dot, or component dot get for rail map. No such component. Now, of course, we're getting no such component because it's not connected. Yes, there's a power relay there, but there's not a relay. So that's the standard response 
because it can't access that component. But if we connected it up, it could. Uh, we can go ns1, and it will return itself. We could also go proxy for ns1, and it will return all the details about what it could do with the computer. So if we want to do, we could also go beep. One second beep from that machine. So as you can imagine, from a code-wise, this will have a lot of impact. A lot of impact on what we can do with the code if we don't need to go around and find all the machine ideas. Because it used to be I'd have to go over here, grab the analyzer, shift right click on that guy, go into here, click the copy at the clipboard, go over to the machine, paste it into there, go to here, and have it paste it into there. And that'll work, but as I said, the moment it changes, we've got a problem, especially if we break the machine or something like that. But now, we just got to go... Pop. And if we wanted to change it, so we wanted to go, okay, well, actually, this is no longer Bob. That's, uh, well, let's actually make the redstone, so... Oops, oh dear, we broke that. Or we want to move it. Let's say we want to move it over to this guy instead. Right, new ID. Which... Obviously, it won't always happen if you're using survival. If you break this guy here, it'll probably keep the ID. But in this case, it won't. So we can go shift right click, hold it down. Okay, it's currently called that, but we can go Bob. Now it's named. We can go back over to here. Obviously, we get our weird output there. Lua, component dot get pop oh. should now go us nine three five oh nine three five oh so what I'm gonna do between episodes is rewrite some of the code so this guy is a little bit more complicated than what it needs to do because obviously we don't need to name them but we do need to know the position which is why you can actually see the position is sent as part of this message. So there's update Bob, the new ID, so redstone, there's the X, Y, and Z position. So then we can use that to determine where it is on here. So this has been quite a console heavy episode, but hopefully in the next episode we'll be able to put this to a much better use. If you liked this episode or found it of any help or any way, please do hit that like button. That tells YouTube that more people should know this code exists. But otherwise, have a great day and see ya!